to talk about esse quam videri, if my Latin's anywhere close. Cicero, in one of his essays on friendship, he's the one who coined this, and if you are from North Carolina at any time of your life, that's their motto. And what it means is to be rather than to seem, as you see on the bottom there, to be rather than to seem. What you are different than what you project, let's say, on the outside. If you're on social media, then you fully understand this phrase, marketing an image that has nothing to do with reality. Marketing an image that has nothing to do with reality. And we see that a lot, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, wherever else. It's, see, what we're going to be looking at this morning in Luke chapter 11, that it's about it, it, it's what you say versus what you do. It's what you show versus who you are. And so Jesus is going to deal with that, that very problem. That let's look, about, let's, let, let's look at the inside, not just the outside. Who you really are, not just the things you run around and do to make yourself look like a Christian. What, what's going on on the inside? We're going we're gonna to look at that. If you're glancing down at a Bible, a paper Bible, and you have the red letter edition, you'll notice there's a whole lot of red letters as we continue on in these next chapters. It will be the same, and, and even on my next slide, I'll put it up behind me, and you'll see I, I purposely put it in red also. Because what Luke is doing at this point is moving from the works of Christ to the words of Christ. So we talked about a number of his miracles and what was happening there, but now he's going to speak, and specifically he's going to be talking to the Pharisees and the lawyers. Those were experts in the religious laws, and so that's who he's going to ultimately be, be talking to. But what I want to do before I even read it, before we even get into it, is invite you this morning to look in the mirror with me, that we would all look at ourselves in the mirror, is what I'm trying to say. If you, because if you don't, as we read this, that you would allow it to God to speak to your heart and challenge you. Otherwise, you're going to walk out the back door and says, well, that was a nice little lesson about them Pharisees and them religious expert peoples over there and miss it completely that it's not about them. It's about you and I. We all struggle with this at some level. And so that'll be our uh, reminder. And so allow me to pray and then we'll, uh, we'll jump in and, and read it. And so, Jesus, we invite you to strip away that thin veneer that we put on the outside of our lives so that others would think better of us, think that we're more spiritual maybe, maybe even throw in some Christian ease so that they'll think we're more spiritual. Lord, forgive us for doing that. God, may we become transparent first to you in our prayer time because we know you know us anyways, but help us to be more honest even in our prayers with you then to be more transparent to our, our friends and family that are, are around us. And so, Lord, uh, help us not to be so focused on the outside of our lives and the impressions people might have of us and help us deal with the core. Help us deal with the, the, the inner matters of the, of the heart. <laughs> oh, Lord, we all love just talking and, and complaining about this world, uh, but rarely do we get honest of what's happening inside our world, inside ourselves, inside our souls. We're just as messed up, but it sure is easier to see on other people. But Lord, uh, do that heart surgery on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Eyes wide open. Verse 33 through 36, he starts, No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or on a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body, and when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light." The function of, the, of a lit lamp is so that others walking into the room would be able to see. We need light to be able to see with. God wants us to live then wide-eyed or eyes wide open, not living squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, which is two things he's going to mention in just a couple of verses. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus was speaking to them and he says, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so many times, Genesis to Revelation, we have this light and darkness comparison. And so it's a metaphor that's very commonly used throughout the scripture. And here Jesus is saying, I'm the light of the world. And really from what we just read, there's other places that say we, you and I, we as believers are lights to this world. Uh, But with that, that's not what it's talking about here in this one. It's specifically talking about Jesus being that light that comes into our life. And you and I both know if we're in a dark room in your garage, in a closet, wherever else, and we turn on the light, the darkness has to flee. And that's what happens when we receive Christ, that light goes on inside of us, and it expels the darkness. And so that's his point, especially with the group that he's going to continue to talk to, because it's in the middle of this, a guy interrupts them. So they're there. Pharisees and the lawyers, they're there, and they're listening in. So they're part of this. It's not, and they left, and a little bit later on, they went and talked to another group. Same group that he's talking to, and they don't have that light inside of them, and he's pointing to that. And so, when you reject light, the only thing left is darkness. You don't get option C. You don't get option number three. Light or darkness, Jesus or not Jesus, and and what is left in that is just the darkness. So here, it's not about... Again, us being the light of the world, but um, the reminder to receive Christ and thus receive the light of the world, the most necessary light. And so he gives us four phrases in there, and we realize that when we finally do see the light, we have different songs that we sing about that, about about seeing the light. Um, But as we see the light, then you will be brought into, you, you will be then full of light, him inside of us. Then you will be wholly bright, is the next phrase there, speaking of our purity, to the one who gives us light. And so those are the four phrases that are there. So you can have a person with no eyesight with plenty of light all around him but not been able to see. That makes sense. But equally as so in the, in the inverse, uh, a person with perfect eyesight but no light, they can't see either. The eye then becomes this instrument of, of light. What happens when we go from a very bright parking lot and we come into this room, it takes us a few seconds before we even see the seats and then pretty soon our eyes are what? They're dilating and what's happening during that dilating process, it's simply letting more light in. And I was thinking, gosh, I wish I had that trigger for me spiritually. When I start going towards the flesh side of it, that something would trigger and it was like, no, dilate, 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 you know, bring more spirit, feed more spirit, you know, as soon as I start going flood but we don't have one of those well we do it's called the holy spirit we just need to learn how to obey him i guess and so the good eyes bad eyes are physical eyes they're amoral they're not good or bad but he's using it as the illustration here of eyes that can see properly and some that are hindered by visual defects or whatever but ultimately the evil eye distorts that spiritual light that's trying to come inside of us or trying to enter and a clear eye becomes a lamp permitting the light to shine within us. Well, let's jump because uh, we'll jump to the next section here and read 37 through 34 because a guy speaks up and invites him over for dinner. So in 37, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. And so he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Just know up front, this isn't a germs issue. It's a law issue that they came up with. Okay, so did not first wash before dinner. Verse 39. And the Lord said to him, so again, he didn't say it out loud. It's just the Lord reading his heart. The Lord said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Well, that would change the conversation at the table, huh? It continues to <laughs> change, right? You fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? God made our bodies, but he made both inside and outside, physical side, spiritual side. You you get that, right? That's, That's what he's saying there. Verse 41, but give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. And then to the first woe. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb And neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Second woe in verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. 
third woe for them. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. The graves were made out of limestone, sometimes in the ground, but usually into the side of the road there. And as they're traveling, let's say on Passover to Jerusalem, you don't want somebody to accidentally lean against one of those. Thus, they'd be defiled. And the whole reason to go to temple to do your sacrifice, you can't do any of that. You have to stay away because you've been defiled by, if you touch the dead body, or in this case, even their tomb. And so they would whitewash them before all of the big ceremonies and that. And he's basically telling them, you're pretty pretty much like that. We'll get to that in a second. Jesus's purpose for woes were to expose sin. So woes expose. That's what it's about. I used to always think that what's happening here is Jesus bringing the hammer. Like, like this is called Jesus uncorked right here, where all of a sudden he just goes off and says, all right, listen, let me get honest with you here. You're rotten to the core. And he's just mad at him. That's not what's going on. And I know that because the Greek word woe, what it, what it gives us here, it infers grief, deep regret, sorrow, piety, or anguish, and not anger. He is not angry at them. He wants them to receive what he just talked about, the light of life. He wants them to be able to get it that Jesus is the light of the world and they're living in darkness even though they're very, 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 very religious. They're missing it. And so with it, it's with angst. It's, he, he hurts over it and just desires their change. So this is loving Jesus going for those that have really messed up a lot of people to be religious and completely miss out on what true religion is all about. Somebody said it this way, the Pharisees had a, a PhD in the irrelevant, but were unlearned in the essentials. Let me say it this way, they lost the plot. They forgot the big idea. That's one of the things I usually research in a chapter that I'm doing. What's the big idea here? Because it's so easy to get off on so many, I can get off on so many different tangents. I study in so many different areas that get thrown in the wastebasket. It, it doesn't, I mean, I, I learn from it obviously, but it's like, no, that doesn't fit. No, that's off track, you know. But it's, it's so it's fun in the learning process and all of that. But, but with that, no, there's, there's a main point. They keep losing the plot. They keep losing the main point. And so their first problem, attention to externalism, to the neglect of the internal condition of their life. Inside was full of greed and wickedness. Clean surface, he's telling them, dirty underneath. Clean surface, dirty underneath. The Pharisees, a.k.a. the faithful ones, now understand, you don't get to read about them in the Old Testament because they didn't exist. In between our Old Testament and our New Testament is 400 years. We call it the intertestamental time. And so 150 years before Christ comes on the scene, New Testament, right, that's when the Pharisees come about. The reason they come about is because they've been in Babylon for 70 years. They've been in exile all that time. They didn't have a temple because it was taken down to the ground. They couldn't do their sacrificial system, so they really couldn't fulfill their ceremonial law and so they got into the law of understanding it that's what they were trying to figure out and so what they came up with these Pharisees were the faithful ones we're going to know what this book says what did Moses mean mostly just the law the first five books as we would call it and so with that, they're the faithful ones now what they understood is badness is out there and so if I build this fence, it's going to keep that, that w the world outside, the ugliness of this world outside, badness, whatever you want to call it, out there. And then I'm going to do another fence and another fence and another fence. And so it's, again, us and them. It's they're dirty out there. I'm clean. I'm holy. They're not. And that's, that's what's happening, which we as Christians oftentimes think along the same line. And again, they're... They're doing it for holiness sake. They're doing it to be pure. They're no, doing it to not be sullied by, by this world. And so maybe what it looks like for us is maybe you're uh, in an aspect of holiness. You'll put the, uh, the computer at home in, in a, a very public area where everybody can see so you're not doing porn. 
But that doesn't save you from doing porn. Just like when I say, you know, it's, it's good that we would set up boundaries in our life. Boundaries are a good thing. Maybe you have an accountability partner. But accountability partners, I've said before, does nothing if you're not going to hold yourself accountable. There's ways to wiggle around and find it out. Great. There's the, there's the computer sitting in the family room where everybody can see it. And you have this in your back pocket where you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, right? It's very easy to be able to dodge all that. So it sounds and looks very holy, but good intentions oftentimes go astray. Let me ask you this. Have you ever judged someone for not living by your extra biblical rules? Your extra biblical rules. We all come up with them. We do. Have you ever looked at them as less faithful or less committed than you are? It's as easy as this. Oh, we don't watch R-rated movies. And you walk away and you hear somebody that does and you walk away is like, I don't watch R-rated movies. And you, put, you, take, you just took them down a notch. You put them down a notch. Now I feel really good about myself. But it doesn't say don't look at R-rated movies. What, what it, there's other things, an issue with that, I guess, in, in some R-rated movies for sure. But with that, we, we come up with our own. Drinking, not drinking. All the different ones, we'll, we'll put that in. I shouldn't say drinking. I should say getting drunk, not getting drunk. You know, and so with them, we start laying all of these out. That's, that's what they were doing. So Jesus walks in. And he doesn't wash his hands. It's like, Jesus, he could have just washed your hands. We wouldn't even have all this problem right here. But, but he, he decides, obviously, he's doing this intentionally. He doesn't wash his hands. Now, again, I already said, it's not about germs. That's not what they're, they're thinking about. It's a purity issue for them. Here's what they're thinking. All day long, we've interacted with the sinful world, with that contaminated world out there. And what if these unholy people touch the same doorknob that I did, and now I'm going to take food? It's that contamination is going to get inside of me. But again, not thinking it from germs, thinking from holiness. Dirty people touch this. I'm holy. I touch this. Now I'm contaminated. So we would always wash before a meal so it doesn't go inside of us. But Jesus said, known that about them, and says in Matthew 15, it's not what you put in, but what comes out of the heart is what defiles you. It's what comes out of the heart defiles you. So to the Pharisees, the outside was the enemy. The world is what is dirty. It's an out there problem. And so they just kept putting more and more and more walls of laws around them to keep them out. Okay, I don't know if you like zombie movies or not. I do not, but I'm not judging you if you do. But I had to watch two. And this was, I was with, uh, I was stuck in a motel room with Dan and and Mike. (laughs) And we were in Pahrump, Nevada. And we were waiting for a class that we were going to do. But anyways, we're there that night and they were so excited because whichever was one of the first big zombie series, whatever, they were doing a special of having two that night joy for me. And so with that, it's just like, they sound so stupid to me. It's like aliens. It's just another genre I just don't get because aliens can do anything. And it's just like, that's, that's not fair. And so, so with that, with this whole alien thing, but, but you think about it, whether they're the reanimated corpses that, uh, that are rising up or a virally infected uh, human beings, the, the plot's always the same. The plot's always the same. Zombies are out there trying to eat and kill the non-zombies, right? And, and then with that, the non-zombies, what are they doing? They're running for safety and they finally find a place that they consider safe. The bad stuff is out there. The contamination is out there. Evil is out there and we're safe in here. But like every zombie movie, no, there's one hiding inside that you didn't know was in there or, or somebody had just gotten bitten right before they came that's part of your team and now they're just going to wait to manifest in a couple of days and they're going to turn into a zombie and that's what goes, sorry if I ruined your whole zombie <laughs> genre, but I don't get it. But there they are. They're convinced that the threat out there can be contained and it can't. It can't be contained because the threat is really in here and that becomes the problem. Okay, back to the Bible. Jesus says, no, the problem isn't out there. That isn't your problem. Your biggest problem is in here. It's in the heart. In Matthew uh, 23, 26, he said, you blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and plate and the outside also may be clean. Think about it. You're washing your cup inside your sink. If you pour the soap inside of it, you're rushing it, you're you're splashing it around, you rinse, 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 rinse. 
it's natural that the outside gets clean too. I'm not saying that's the way you should do your dishes. I, I'm just saying that's if you take care of the inside, the outside's going to get taken care of also. That's what he's saying. I think it was similar with the Great Wall of China, if it's true. I, I still haven't found out where exactly, but obviously with uh, especially the Mongolians up above them up north, it's too thick of a wall, it's too high of a wall, it's too long of a wall to go around. And so, but in the different times of history, there actually, it was breached, but it was because they would pay off the guy at the gates. Now, a uh, mini historian came up last and he says, actually, it's correct because what they would do is because it was so long to go around the wall is they would set up little communities just on the north side of that. They would set up little communities just outside the gate. They would become friends with the gatekeeper. And so with that, there was the kind of the interaction there. But again, that same thing. Here's a wall. We're going to keep them out. But that's not it. If you don't deal with the hearts of all your soldiers, of every one of your men, those on the inside, it's still an inside issue. All right, let's get to the three woes. Woe well, number one was verse 42. You tithe mint, rue, and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Notice he doesn't say you don't have to tithe all the way down to the herb. Even though Moses never said that. It's not written in the law anywhere. It's actually written in their Mishnah, the oral traditions. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then so it was in their laws. But they didn't need to do that. But Jesus didn't say, don't do that. That's not what I said to tithe. No, if you mean that from your heart and you want to tithe something else that the Bible hasn't come up with and you're doing it as unto the Lord, the Lord's going to say, thanks. That's generous of you. That's awesome. If you're walking down the sidewalk and find a penny and take it home and put it in your vice and get out your hacksaw and cut off exactly one-tenth of it and come and put it in our, I know I'm going to get one. I said it all three services. I know I'm going to get one in one of our boxes back here. But you, you can do that. But what about the weightier matters? You can tithe a, a tenth of your spice cabinet, but instead remember, God wants you. He wants all of your heart. Two things, I, I want justice and the love of God. And it's really love of God and love of your fellow man by the justice aspect. And so love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Simply, with all you got, with all that you are, right? It's, it's your everything, your attitudes, all of that. Just love your God that way. And this, ju this justice, this, in, the, in the Old Testament, it's mishpat, and it goes in two different directions. That means to, that somebody does something wrong, they need to be punished and, and, and pay for that. That's one part of justice. But the other part of justice is the care for the vulnerable. And so making sure those that are most vulnerable are taken care of, especially when they're abused, especially when somebody that has more money or more strength or more whatever is overpowering them. Make sure you take care of them, it says. And so with that, it's the simple love God, love your fellow man. That's what's most important. And you guys aren't doing that. But you're all of a sudden scrutinizing whether you're all the way down to your little herb plants that if it has 100 leaves, I'm going to pluck 10 of them and, and bring them down to the temple. Believers, don't confuse what is surface Christianity to what is plunging the depths. Surface Christianity, I, I come to church, I, I read the Bible, sometimes I tip God while I'm there, and, and, and you can go through kind of the levels of I pray once in a while, and I do this, and I do that, o okay. But ultimately what we're looking at at a genuine Christian, at least what Christ is saying here, the top of the list there is the love for God, that that's what we would measure Christianity by. Not that they're running around serving and doing all those things, those are all good, we're, we're challenged and encouraged to do, to do those also, but first and foremost, love of God, love of man. Well, number two is our uh, evil motives in verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greeting in the marketplaces. You love public flattery. You love being at the head of the table. We just have to be careful about being self-centered, self-promoting. That's the issue at hand. They only cared about themselves. I thought an interesting illustration. Ptolemy the first was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. And so he took over uh, uh, Egypt. And uh, of course, Alexandria is right at the top, right up next to the Mediterranean there. And so what he wanted to do when, uh, when he had taken over is build this mammoth 
lighthouse, and he did. And it was called the Pharos, P-H-A-R-O-S. And he got a guy named uh, Sostra, uh, Sostratus uh, to design it, and later became one of the seven uh, ancient wonders of the world. And so, uh, anyways, as Ptolemy was telling so- so- Sostratus, uh, what to, uh, to do. He uh, said, I wanted to bear my inscription. And uh, Sostratus didn't like that at all. It's like, I don't, the king shouldn't get all the glory. I'm the one building it, designing it, building it, and doing all of that. And so he came up with a plan. He actually did this. He, he well, he plastered on the side of it, uh, told me the first name, okay? So he places that on the side. But figuring that, it actually sits out in the ocean on this giant platform but the waves are always slapping against it. And eventually, the plaster would wear away. But he'd be able to live. He calculated out about how long he thought he would live and how much plaster to put on. So he made it pretty thick and did that. And it actually worked. And so the king ends up dying. And finally, right as it's eroding away, he had chiseled his name into marble underneath it. And so then that was there for the other time. So as so worldly fame often disappears before the relentless waves of time. And so if that's what you're all about, it doesn't last. We even joke about people getting their 10 minutes of fame, you know, if they make it on the news, you know, or whatever else. And if that's what you're after, you're missing the mark. And that's this corrupting, uh, that's this uh, evil motives. Make sure we don't have those e- evil motives. The third one there, the corrupting influence um, in verse 44. In 44, it says, woe to you for you're like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. They were unconsciously exerting a, a, a corrupt influence to all who are following their lead. And so contact with a grave uh, uh, caused defilement and contact with the Pharisees did the same thing. It caused defilement. It's causing the same thing. They understand the one, but do you see the other in your own life? That's what you're doing here. Well, at that point, somebody else spoke up. And in verse 45, uh, Let me advance our screen here. In verse uh, 45 through the end, one of the lawyers, and again, as you hear the word lawyer, think of one who was an expert in religious law, expert in what Moses had said. So one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also, which is pretty funny. The next thing I would write, I write, say, Jesus, well, if the sandals fit, you know, anyways, he just ramps it up. And he said, woe to you lawyers also. So you want to speak up? You want to hear your side now? I have three for you. Woe to you lawyers also for you load people with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. I would add shame on you. Verse 47, woe to you for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed and so you were witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers for they killed them and you built their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. And then the last woe, verse 52, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. And as he went away from there, the scribes and Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So we catch all of their heart behind all of this. So they speak up and say, uh, hey, you're making us feel bad. He says, oh, am I? Let Let me talk with you for a minute. See, Jesus is speaking of their boatload of man-made additional commandments. Not Moses' commandments that God gave Moses, but the ones that they add. Now, they accumulated them all the way up until it was codified in the uh, 200 AD, uh, putting all of these together. Extra laws describing what Moses really meant. What Moses really meant. And so, again, while they were away in exile in Babylon, I'm talking about the Jews, while they were doing that, again, the, that's where they came up, I said earlier, about the synagogue, because they didn't have the temple, they couldn't do the ceremonial law. So it's all about the written law and why the Pharisees come into, into play here. 
So in their studies, it's all about that question. What did Moses mean by that? That was their biggest question. What did Moses mean by that? Now, the Bible only gives a few paragraphs of how to keep the Sabbath. It says, keep it holy, but it doesn't say all the details of how. For instance, it says, do not carry a burden on the Sabbath. That's all it says. They end up in their what's known as the Jewish Mishnah, 24 chapters to answer that question. Coming up basically with laws. Or if you took folio paper, which is 12 by 19 front and back, it would take 156 pages of that is what they came up with of how not to do the Sabbath, what you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Let me just give you one illustration. This is from the Mishnah itself of what it says of what you could carry on the Sabbath. Ready? Food equal in weight to a dried fig. Enough wine for mixing in a goblet. Goblet. Milk enough for one swallow. I don't even know how you carry that. Or why don't you just swig it before your trip? But anyways. Honey enough to put upon a wound. Oil enough to anoint a small member. Uh, that doesn't mean a short person. That means like your pinky, you know, one of the members of your body. Water enough to moisten an eye salve. So maybe it was like a powder that they had to add a little bit of water, water to. You could do that. Ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet. Don't try to write three. And read enough to make a pen so they can carry a feather. So that's the detail that they were digging down into. So when Jesus comes on the scene, it's like Moses wasn't thinking about that. My father wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't thinking about that. How did you come up with all of these? And so with Jesus not washing his hands, which is what this all goes back to, right? Is, no, that's your rule, not mine. Why don't you look at God's rule? Pretty simple, justice, love God. That's where we're going with all of this. So their three, denunci uh, their three woes, the first one of the denunciation of their insecurity in 45 and 46, excuse me, insincerity, I said insecurity. Woe unto you lawyers, you load people with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Crushed people, crushed people under this heavy load of legalism. And that's what legalism is when we step just beyond the Bible and say, I think this is what it means by that and this is what I do for my life. You can do it for your life, perfectly fine becomes legalism when now I tell you to do that. So I can choose. We use R-rated movies earlier. If I say, um, hey, I don't, I don't see R-rated movies, fine for me. I can make that choice for my life. But if I'm up here saying you're never allowed to see one, that becomes legalism because that's not what it says, okay? And so they're crushing with heavy loads of legalism. They trampled them with their godless traditions. And then they wouldn't even live up to their own code, telling all these people you should do this. This is what makes you holy and wouldn't even do it themselves. Second one is hypocrisy. It's this satire, ar ar irony, and sarcasm about, uh, um, you know, the, the, prop, the killing of the, the prop, building the tombs of the prophets that were there, the very prophets that killed the, the, the ones that, that God had sent. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way, their fathers killed the prophets, and they put monuments up to kill prophets and went on with the same business of killing prophets. And so that, that's kind of what's happening in, in the thing there. It's just like, this makes no sense at all. And, and basically putting on the blood of them from Abel to Zechariah. What that means, see, their Old Testament, the scriptures as they call them, doesn't end with Malachi. Second Corinthians is what it ends with. Abel was the first one that, whose blood, he was murdered uh, by his brother. And so that's the first blood we hear about. And then in Second Chronicles chapter 24 and verse 20 and 21 is when this Zechariah, uh, different from our other Zechariahs, like the book of Zechariah, when he was killed. And so the whole range of Old Testament history is thus uh, indicated here that they were guilty of, basically. Last woe, we'll wrap up with this. They kept the doors locked. In 52, woe to you lawyers for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering. Everything they studied was the law. They had the keys in their hand and they not, ended up not going into the door, going through that door where Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He becomes that entrance way, that, that way to be able to let the light come shining in. They wouldn't go in themselves and they were hindering everybody else from going in. 
That was the very office of what they were supposed to be about. Even that word Pharisee comes from a word to be pure, and they missed out on it. And same with these lawyers here. You've hid the key, your office loaned you, and now you won't let others in also. Wow. Essay quam videri. To be rather than to seem. Our God cares about each and every one of our hearts, the inside, who we really are, not what we project ourselves to be because we're posers in a lot of different areas of our life, if we'll be honest. And so it's learning to be transparent with our God and just undone before him as we come to him in our prayers, being honest in that way. That's what he desires. And then thus learning how to do that with our family and our friends and just being real and raw and honest with who we are. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would recover the, uh, the original plot, the big idea, even as we sing in the next song about justice and about loving our God via worship. Thank you for that reminder. Lord, help us to be a Jesus follower rather than just running around doing what we consider Christian things. Lord, we pray that you would uh, forgive me for how many times as I read this and as I'm studying this, I'm convicted of how much Pharisee still exists inside of me, how much lawyers still exist inside of me, how often I don't want to get transparent. I want to hide behind my good works. I want to hide behind the few things I'm doing well. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive us. Lord, teach us each and every day to become more and more transparent, more and more like your son, Jesus. Help us to focus on the weightier matters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.